To me, the glory of being a writer is the freedom it gives you to explore your own mind, your imagination and fantasies, your passions and obsessions, and your experience. Sometimes the worst things that can happen to you, as well as the best or the ordinary, will provide you with your best material. So even when you're going through some kinds of horrors, you can always think, if you're a writer, I'll be able to use this. <laughs> Especially if you write from the heart and cultivate the habit of pleasing yourself in your work, not others. Now this is not to say that you don't want write to reach other people too, your audience. You write for them as well of your, as yourself. But that's a different part of the writing process. There are two parts. First, you let your imagination and mind roam freely wherever they take you in a free experimental mode if you want. And uh, you explore any subject matter, no matter how private or taboo or awful or wonderful and in any style that grabs you. But then, the second part, which is just as important as the first, you read what you've written critically, like a stranger from a distance, <coughs> excuse me, as if reading it for the very first time with a sharp, critical eye. You read it for clarity and emotional impact, as if you were a stranger, and for the form and the grace and the style, and then you revise it. Now, some writers uh, do this second part after generating a draft. Some do it as they go along, some do both. But we all do it, repeatedly. Every girl her own critic, every girl her own editor. Eventually, you, if you stick to it, you'll develop that skill and those two essential processes of writing will come together for you. So it's kind of paradoxical. Writing gives you freedom. And I don't mean financial freedom. <laughs> it gives you freedom to explore your own experience and your own mind and imagination. But it also teaches you the opposite of freedom to constrict your work, to set limits on it, to craft it. That's really what crafting means, the way a woodworker cuts away at the wood. Crafting, the opposite of freedom. And together, you produce a work. And not only do you have these two processes for your own work, but with works that you uh, read, the works that you find inspiring and that you love. You should read them at least twice or more, three times. The first time, you read it for the impact on yourself, the emotional meaning of it, the meaning of it. And the second time, you read it to see how the author did it. You outline it or diagram it if you want to lay bare the structure, especially in a complex work. Uh, you notice the language. You read with the same critical eye that you read your own work. Uh, and you learn from that. So to me, I think the most important thing for a young writer, but also for an old writer, is to just read, 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 and expand your understanding of what is possible when you write. Now, tonight, I understand that Open Road is giving as a gift to every writer who's reading tonight a copy of my new essay collection. Now, I'm very happy of that, about that. Um, I think of myself primarily as a novelist, although I ha I'm, my new novel is the first one in decades because I was sidetracked with writing memoirs <laughs> and other things. Um, but, you know, as I say, you should read everything, then you can write in many different genres, too. Anyway, um, several of the essays in the collection that you'll be given 
um, were at the time that I wrote them considered scandalous and outrageous when they were first published. And maybe some of them still are. We'll see when the book is published. But if you read them, you'll see what I mean about being free to talk about anything, the most taboo subject, letting loose. That's what you have to do. And exercising your freedom, not holding back at all. But you'll also see, I hope, what I mean about controlling your writing through self-criticism and form. I hope you can see both of those things. Um, uh, my new novel, which has been called by early reviewers um, um, uh, delightfully wicked, verging on malevolent, is <laughs> another illustration of how you can be as bad as you want in your writing. It's not necessarily going to turn off your readers. Um, anyway, since you're going to have my essays, I thought that I would um, read from my new satirical novel tonight a little bit. Um, it's about, it, it's, it's in part a satire on the writing life. So don't take it too seriously if you read it. <laughs> um, Anyway, it's about three characters, two of whom are writers. Mac is a developer, part of the 1%, uh, whose work takes him away from home a lot. Um, his wife is Heather, uh, a would-be writer whose writing is on hold while she's ra uh, raising her young children and before they're in, really in school, except for an a couple of hours a day. And the third one is Zoltan, Barbu, an uh, immigrant writer from Eastern Europe who was once a literary star, and he's still quite famous, but he's had a massive case of writer's block for a number of years. I hope none of you ever know, learn firsthand what that is. Um, and uh, he's broke and he's about to be evicted, so Mac invites him to come and um, move in with him and Heather in their gorgeous house uh, so that she will have a writing companion while Mac is away working, because um, he's away a lot. And Zoltan can write his masterpiece under ideal circumstances with Mac as the patron. Um, first, I'll read a little, a couple of pages to introduce Heather, and then I'll read from chapter 10, um, a month later, Af on the very night that Zoltan has first moved in with them. All right, this is the Heather part. The children were asleep, and Heather was curled up with Tina the cat in the big green chair reading a book. For her, reading was more than a pastime, like watching a movie. It was an elevating, intimate act. She read slowly, carefully, pencil in hand, marking the margins in a private code, lingering over certain passages, copying into a special notebook those words or phrases that touched her or that she thought she might like to use in her own writing, occasionally posting over her desk brief passages that spoke directly to her. Such physical acts of communion made the author's words seem almost her own. Ideas were real to her. A well-turned phrase, sparkling like a gemstone, made her laugh out loud, and certain images could cloud her eyes with tears. Sometimes she was so swept up by a book that she wanted to read on to the end in a single sitting, one long caress, at the same time longing to go slowly in order to postpone the climax, make it last. She prized her books, of which she now owned a thousand volumes. She realized that the very survival of written of paper books, tangible, odorous, dog-eared, tear-stained, food-smeared, marginalia-enhanced physical objects whose pages bore traces of each individual reading, was doomed in the face of electronic readers. For that reason, she had not yet bought herself a device, ugly word, and, uh, uh, in order to speed the slaughter. 
On the contrary, she withdrew into her, her books like an addict, n addict nursing a habit. She sometimes joked that it was when their New York apartment didn't have room for another book that she finally let Mag convince her to leave the city for the suburbs. Perhaps if she'd had time to write her stories, she would not have resented Mag's absences or felt so often lonely. But with her children at home, and even during the brief morning hours that they were in preschool, she found herself unable to summon the necessary concentration concentration or discipline to work. Later, she promised herself, when she had larger blocks of time. Okay, now this is a month later, and Zoltan has arrived. Mac said, it's settled then, we'll keep him. Sounds good to me, said Heather. The coffee table in the living room was must, like a bed after love. A nearly empty cigarette pack Butts of half-smoked cigarettes cold in the ashtrays, coffee slopped into saucers, tangerine peels and grape seeds, crumpled foil from chocolate truffles, assorted glasses and their rings, an almost empty bottle. Zoltan rested his elbow on the mantle of the tall fireplace like a large bird of prey perched on a low branch. For how long? Can I stay, he asked, dangling a cigarette. If this works out, said Mac, then I hope you stay at least till you finish your book. Heather, said Zoltan in a low murmur, catching her in the dark gleam of his eye. From the sofa where she slouched, Heather, who had given up smoking with her first pregnancy, lit her second cigarette of the night and blew a ring. I say he stays as long as he's this charming. Zoltan crumpled the empty cigarette pack and tossed it onto the embers, watching to see the cellophane explode in a giddy burst of yellow spark and green flame. If I may, he said, I wish to propose a toast. Oh, do, said Heather, rising out of her slouch to lift her glass. Zoltan squared his shoulders and cleared his throat. He raised an eyebrow and lifted his glass then immediately lowered them both. First, I have a question. It is obvious what I gain in this extraordinary situation you offer, this writer's paradise, but not clear how you benefit. As far as I'm concerned, said Mac, settling down uh, beside Heather, I'll be happy just to see you back on your feet, able to write your book. That's good enough for me. Most gracious benefactor, said Zoltan with a mock bow, then seriously, but why, if I may ask? I like your work. I think it's important, said Mac. Though Zoltan appreciated Mac's confidence, he wondered if he could possibly produce what Mac expected of him, especially now with the publishing world a shambles and the pressures that had gri driven him east beginning to ease. Heather tilted her head and smiled coyly. Yes, why do we need you, Zoltan? Ask your husband, said Zoltan. It is he who invited me here. Since you're here now, said Heather, I'd rather ask you. Zoltan lowered his voice to a croon and tossed it back to her. Tell me what you desire of me, Mrs. McKay. Too soon to tell, she said. Then say what you hope said Zoltan. Her eyes shone with excitement as she returned the intense gaze the writer had locked on her. She could not remember the last time she had received such penetrating attention or when she had felt such giddy exhilaration. She tried to think of something to say. Nothing came. Then, feeling her throat begin to tighten, she asked in a small voice, the truth? If you dare, said Zoltan. Come on, Heather, said Mac. Your turn now. Tell us what you want out of this. OK, she said, reaching for her glass. This is easy. I hope to learn whatever secrets you have to teach us. But even if I turn out to be a lousy student, at least I'll have someone interesting to talk to. Zoltan nodded slowly as if sealing a pact. 
Again, he raised his glass, and again, he fixed his glittering gaze on each of them in turn, bringing it to rest on Heather. The toast, the toast, said Mac impatiently. Here, said Zoltan, is the toast, that we each find what we are looking for. Mac lifted his empty glass to his lips and said, hear, hear. But Heather drank in silence without taking her eyes from Zoltan's. After a moment, Zoltan nodded to each of them, then drained his glass and tossed it with a grand flourish like some 19th century count into the fire where it shattered. Heather was astounded. To her dismay, she felt her throat close down and tears well up in her eyes. Before the betrayal of her body was complete and the tears overflowed the lids, she snatched up the fruit bowl and hurried to the kitchen, hoping no one had seen. Thank you.